all stand and can we just bless God for all that has happened so far? Now y'all been acting real. Now come on, let's try it again. Let's let's thank God for all that's happened so far. Thank you, my Lord. All right. Yeah, it was just, you know, just love everybody. Amen. Real powerful. All right, let's let's go to the word of God. Um, let's go to scriptures. Uh, turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, 1, we all know this scripture. Um, to all of our online viewers, hey, I'm so happy that you're here. So happy that all of you all are here. Um, very much uh, online, Facebook and YouTube and all the kind of stuff. If you have a Facebook account, grab your phones real quick and share it. Share the live. Hey, let me, let me share this out to my peoples and let them be uh, encountered by Jesus as well. All right, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and 1. And I'm going to go uh, to another scripture too. It'll be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Um, I would admonish you all to please pay attention today. I think what the Lord has is going to be very helpful. And so you need a man. All right, Hebrews 11, 1. We should know this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. James 5, 17 and 18 says, Elijah was a human being, even as we were. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Verse 18, again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My vision is hope. You may be seated. My vision is hope. Father, without you, I'm nothing. With you, we are everything. Let's have a good time. In Jesus' name, amen. This is going to be uh, super significant for you, and there are several reasons why this is. We started a conversation on Thursday. Thursday, if you missed Thursday's Bible study, please go back and watch it. Um, it, was, it was great. Um, but we started a, a conversation on Thursday, um, and the concern for me is, um, and there's no really other way to say it, we are really a, a selfish people. We really are selfish. We just, we really, we, we are, I believe in self-care and I believe in, in really leaning into yourself, knowing what's going on, I'm having an awareness to where you are at mentally, emotionally, psychologically. But then sometimes I feel like we, we intoxicate self-care to the point where we are so self-focused that we are no longer God-centered. And I think it's so important that we cannot lose vision and we cannot lose focus on what God is trying to do and what God is trying to say. So let's dive into this and see where we get to and how much we can get through. The greatest offense to breakthrough, any kind of breakthrough of any sort, is disappointment. When you are disappointed, you are full of whatever that disappointment is until you feel like you're ready to move on. Now, this is going to be a quiet service. Maybe by, by midway, I'll be all right, though. Here, here is the great concern with this, though, as we are moving through. We all long for and desire encouragement. We want encouragement. We need encouragement. I think you need encouragement. And encouragement's not bad. It's really good. But even the encouragement that you receive from other people is nothing but like supplements you take. It can work or it cannot work. If you have a headache, you take a pill. Sometimes that pill works, and then sometimes that pill does not work. But you have to find something that's always going to feed your soul, positively feed your soul. Mama Sharon and I were talking about uh, food and counting calories and stuff on Thursday. And I never did that until I took weight loss seriously. But the concern is a lot of us will just see something that looks good. But we don't look at the actual benefits of it 
or the disadvantages of it because we don't want to take time to look at the back of something. We see it, we want it. Versus like, let me see if I, if I eat this, if I take this, then what exactly will this do? How will it benefit me? You can eat anything, take anything as long as it's within reason and according to serving size. But we don't like that because we want, you know, 15 donuts instead of one. That number on the back is per serving size, not per the entire container. <laughs> so that 290 for that one donut is not for the whole box, it's for one donut. There's eight of them in there. Okay. <laughs> Help us, Lord. <laughs> Each of us have a responsibility, though, to maintain our level of hope in our lives. Each of us have that responsibility. Say, I am am responsible responsible for my hope. hope. Many people, though, live in a place of famine because they always want someone else to bring them some good news. (laughs) And honestly, y'all, he loves to hide things. Hear me, and what is most offensive to your life. He will place things in what is most offensive to your life, and that includes circumstances, that includes situations. Write down Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. It says, it's the glory of God. It's talking about the glory of God, how that conceals the matter. The glory of God conceals the matter. And it's the glory of kings that search out a certain matter. Okay? So, God does not hide things for, from us. He hides them for us. He's not holding back his hand. He will put something right here for you to search it out and to find. And when you do find it, it is your responsibility to nurture it well. Everything is within reach. We just don't feel like it is. Because we don't want to work to seek what he has for us. We want everything easy. I feel like we want God to be an easy bake oven chef. Microwave. But that easy bake oven can sit in your room. Because it don't take as much electricity. Because we don't want to get, we don't want to leave the, our, our confined space. So we'll take this one little thing and we just go, like, oh, it's fine, it's good. And we just, you know, we press a little button and go, Ding! Oh, yay! The cake is done. Anything quick, hear me. Anything quick is unhealthy. And we desire for things to be so quick. I made a status about how we have forgotten about the timing of God. We don't want his timing for anything. We want what we want in our time. And if it's not in our time, we limit our worship and our capacity for him because we don't like what he is not giving us when we want it. Do you see the concern in what you, when you want your desire and your voice to be filled instantaneously? How dangerous it is? Because if you are void-centered and not vision-centered, you are going to find yourself locked in something that's going to, find, that's going to be really hard to get out of eventually. It's going to take someone else coming to help you, pulling you out. And can I be honest? I think that there are people who are trying to reach toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. However, we cannot get there because we have to keep turning around to get somebody else out of the hole. So the kingdom of God is within reach. Say that with me. The kingdom of God is within reach. Many live with this theology about kingdom that is present, but we never learn how to search out the treasures that that the kingdom has for us. The kingdom is full of so many things, but man, we don't take time to search out the beauty of what's there. The kingdom of God is fully loaded, y'all. It's like a bank that you walk into. You know you have the money there, but you never leave the lobby to talk to a teller. You know you have the ability to go up there and say, hey, I want that. I need that out. But you never do. That's the sad part. So the enemy works real hard to keep us locked in fear and anxiety, distraction, uh, bad decisions, all that stuff. And to keep us anxious so that we lose sight of the solution that God is for us. 
Because when we cannot find a solution in him as quick as we want to, we find a solution in other people and other things. So he'll work hard to make sure that we're anxious, to live in anxiety. He'll make us that way. Are you all paying attention? Because we don't like God's choice of solutions. So God intends to work the impossible only through yielded people. But we cannot be yielded people if we're distracted people. So hope always positions you for surrender. It keeps you in a place of surrender. But hopelessness will rob you, listen, of the beauty of sacrifice. Hopelessness robs you, takes you away from the beauty of what you have to give up. Here's why I say that. Because when everything is good, oh man, we are right. But the moment that something comes in to rob us of hopelessness, we don't, I'm not giving up nothing. I'm not praying. I'm not fasting. He didn't do it before. What makes you don't think you're going to do it again? See how that snake pride rises up? Because it, it takes away everything that we just, all of our history becomes a waste when we lose hope. Hope is the long-term view. That's, that's really the point. We all have a testimony. Should. We should have a testimony. Praise the Lord. We really all should have a testimony, which means you are no longer there. It's not still defeating you. It doesn't keep coming back up. It doesn't make you put on two faces. You know, we, 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 we love to play, you know, hopscotch, you know, one, two, three. Because, you know, hey, how are you, how you doing? And you're next to you, you're like, hey, what up? Like, it's, it's, I'm trying to figure out the difference. It takes a lot to manage two personalities. And the fact that you keep living it out proves that you are really struggling with insanity. So the testimony is so important. We must realize the importance of testimony. Someone screamed the word testimony. So God can do everything better than we can, but he chooses to use us. He doesn't need us. He chooses to use us. To, to do his mission and to live out his mission in the earth. And hopelessness will always rob you of any potential you have ever thought you had. Any potential you've ever thought you had. Hope anticipate. It wants something. It desires something. And hope, listen, hope will always attract circumstances and situations that help you do the will of God. Even if it's bad. Circumstances. Rough circumstances. It all for the greater purpose of God. Hope comes from the very nature of God. It's who he is. It's hope is a product of actually living a surrendered life. That's why the devil is after your surrender. He can only have it if you give it to him. But the reason why he is after your surrender so much so is, listen, because if he can get your surrender, he gets your hands lifted. And if you get out of position as a worshiper, you go right into war. There is no gray area between the two. It's either worship or it's war. And the moment that you come out of worship, you go right into war. The struggle is only real to people who submit to war. <laughs> the struggle is so real. And we go through so much. Oh, my gosh. Every single day, every single week. It's only worse to those who are not surrendered. If I keep my hands lifted and keep my eyes fixed on him, I don't have a reason to look at anything else. Nothing else gets my attention. And we live so distracted trying to figure out where, why, why is so much going on? Because you're looking at the wrong thing. When's the last time you had a vision exam? To look at and see, hey, what's going on with me? Why is my focus off? Why am I distracted so much? And here's the reason why. Because hope is a product of presence. You only have hope if you are a worshiper. You only have hope if you are a worshiper. No one looks into the face of God and does not leave without, without hope. It's not possible at all. Because hopelessness only reveals the distance you have between you and him. If you are hopeless, you have not been worshiping. Only people who don't take time with him are, hope, are hopeless. 
but the more you take time with him I'm telling you that's why I said you start your day and you end your day with him if you're going to see him saying Lord I thank you you have my night covered you have my next day covered I have nothing to fret the Lord is my shepherd I shall not I go to sleep with his language I wake up in his love but when you choose not to go to sleep with his language, you wake up in your fear. Then the input comes of anxiety. It rules your day because you have lost language for your morning. I want us also to get out of the habit of this whole common sense thing. Because we, we need things to make sense to us. Anything with God does not make sense. I was talking to somebody last week and I was telling them if it does make if people aren't asking you what the heck you're doing, then you're probably in the wrong. If they're asking you that, you're in the will of God because you can't explain it. Nor should you be explaining it to people who have no commitment to your future or destiny. Praise the Lord. So if, 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 if it makes sense to you too much, it's, it's not God because God doesn't make your sense. You have to learn how to be okay with walking in the valley with not much instruction. You have to be willing to learn to walk in the valley without much voice. Follow what he said. And until he speaks again, if he said keep walking around in a circle for 15 months, you keep walking around in a circle. And, 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 and when the moment that, that hopelessness starts to move it, no, nope, God told me, so I got to keep on walking. And no matter what, y'all, I don't care how tired you get, even if you change the rhythm of your pace, don't stop walking. The problem is we, oh, I'm tired of this. I'm so sick of, God is so tired of our complaining. Right. When comes the time that we grow up? Over and over and over again. There is so much, y'all, that we have access to. There is so much we have availability to. We don't have to live in sickness and defeat and jobless and hopeless and faith. We don't have to live in that stuff. That's the enemy. But when comes a time we don't just shout in here and you go out of these doors and you live right in defeat. Right. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, you're so worthy. And the moment you leave here, I just, I don't know about my life. I want to just kill myself. I'm just so sick of everything. Why, Lord? Why does it just got to be? Why, is it, why always? Why do we have the language of the devil in the mouth of a believer? You submit to this vocabulary change of defeat when you should always have the vocabulary of victory coming from your mouth. And even when it doesn't look like it, you still have something correct to say. Amen. I don't care about it. None, none of y'all then. If you're mad. If you're not, I love you. Because the more that we keep su submitting to fear, that means men controls your life. The more that we keep submitting to fear, that means the more men control, I have to look a certain way. I have to put on a facade. I have to learn how to fit in correctly. So I got to make sure that, you know, that if fear control, I got to make sure I'm looking the part so no one can tell I'm actually am fearful. But you living in fear invites you into people pleasing. And in that people pleasing, there is no changing or challenging or transformation going on in your life. Sometimes the reason why we're so stagnant is because we don't want to simply evolve and stop people pleasing. What if they leave me? What if they abandon me? What if they stop talking to me? What if they hate me? What if they're not a fan of who I am? What if I lose people? What if I can't go there anymore? What if I can't do that? Sometimes God is not God's punishment to pull you away. It's his promise trying to take over your life. But if you get so mad at what you're losing, you'll never see the benefit of what you are about to gain. Some, sometimes gaining is emptiness. <laughs> Ma, Claire, come on, wake up. Sometimes your emptiness actually is you, meaning that God is getting ready to blow my mind. If something is empty, that means I'm actually doing all right. 
For years, 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 I've been wanting a Hammond organ. For years, y'all, years. I said, I was telling my mom, I said, Mom, I want to have a Hammond organ. I looked at prices, all these prices were expensive. And so I got this house, and I always kept an area clear for it. Because I knew God was going to bless me with a Hammond organ. We didn't like the situation in which it came by. But Mama Sharon said, I got an organ. You can have it, I ain't going to do nothing with it. But I kept the area clear. Why? Because I knew that something belonged in there. I knew, so I kept the area prepared because promises only come to a prepared people. So I kept the area clean because I know that God has something for me. Let me ask you a question. What do you keep feeling that God says, leave it empty? Because God says, make room for it. And don't you put nothing there. And the way that God can tell if you are really ready for the promise is if you keep it empty. I don't put something in there because I need something there. I wait until the right time for it. So I don't use a temporary filler. I don't use a momentary thing. I don't get a little temporary little boo thing in the meantime. I don't care what it looks like. I will wait until the right thing happens for me. And until then, I will be content with what I don't have because I know eventually I will have more than enough. Hallelujah. Hey. Here's the concern. Praise the Lord. I wasn't supposed to be doing all this today. Praise God. Woo! All right. Write down Psalm 42, verse 5. Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. The complete Jewish uh, version of the Bible says that it talks about how the salvation comes from his presence. Here's the concern, y'all. If you don't get in his face, you'll always look like you. I can tell who's been with God based on how you're looking that day. By the time, by the way you walk into a room, if something shifts, I can tell. We can tell. But when you are so consumed with everything on the outer, it is very obvious to people who know God. Why? Because all this other luggage is offensive in the presence of God if you won't surrender it. You have to learn how to surrender and throw it all. And you cannot choose to hold your stuff and try to lift your hands at the same time. Because your hands are full, which means God can't fill them. You can't lift a full, consumed heart to God and ask him to cleanse it when you won't get rid of stuff in the first place. This is the message of hope. I'm fussing a little bit. Yeah, but you should still feel encouraged and hopeful. Why? Because there's something coming. And the reason why I'm preaching this with such passion is because there is something coming down the pipeline that you're going to need hope for. And if you are without hope, you will feel hopeless. You will feel like God has abandoned you or forgotten you. And I don't want one part of the church to be blessed and the other part to be in lack because you chose not to have hope. Hope is always displayed in the middle of controversy. If you can walk through the wilderness and still act like you're winning, you have hope. If you can hold your head up high, you don't know what the next thing is, you got some hope. If you can drive and that gas tank is on E and the gas light is on, and you still driving when you got a full tank of gas, you got some hope. Why? Because God always takes care of what belongs to him. And hope belongs to him. Hopelessness belongs to you. Ezekiel 39, 29 says, I will not hide my face from them any longer, which means God said, I'm not going to hide my face at all. I'm going to show them everything. I have poured out my spirit on them. He's not hiding anything, which means, y'all, my point for bringing up those two scriptures is simply this. If you get in his presence, there's no way you can leave without hope. Hope comes from that place. And if you realize, y'all, listen to me, if you, this week, you're going to be challenged with them same old things you keep surrendering to in the former weeks. But what stops the same thing coming is if you do something different. Y'all feel me? Because if you do something different, that means something has to change. If the devil knows he can't get in the same way, then why would he keep on coming in? Y'all feel me? If the devil knows you leave the back door unlocked, he's going to keep on walking in. But the moment he tries to... 
Oh, man, what happened? He has to find a different way. But when a house is built on hope, he can't find a way in, and he may try to walk around the parameter, but because my angels are positioned in the right place, I have nothing to fear. We say in Scripture, it's like all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord called according to his purpose. We love that Scripture, right? We'll, we'll, we'll say it in, in the face of tears. <laughs> Just in that cry. All things, Lord, you told me this. All things work together for the good of those that love God. You're just all emotional. The concern is you have a great offense to what God is using to make things work together for you. My mom is a cook. Pamela Doris Jean cooks well. But I was a very picky eater as a kid, still am, judge your mama, not mine. And so if I saw her using something that I considered nasty, I didn't want to eat it. So she would, she would tell me to go back in your room and, and you wait till I'm done. Because a good chef does not allow his audience to watch him. Yeah. So I would have to go and sit and wait. But when she said, and I heard that, when I heard that, uh, that on the table, I knew that plate just hit. And she would say, now come and eat. And it would look extremely good. It did not look like all those 17 ingredients she had and all those seasonings and toppings and all that stuff. It looked like a, a well complete thing that looked so well. And the concern is a lot of you all are too busy trying to peek into God's kitchen. And you've grown an offense to what he is using to work all to work all these things for your good. Here's your problem. You don't like that he left you in divorce. You don't like that he took away your friends. You don't like the way he said leave that job. You don't like the way he said change that, move here, go there, take away that, stop doing that, leave them alone, block them, delete them. You hate that. What you don't see is there is a promise on the other side that is going to look so great if you hold on a little while. You're so mad, and you don't even know it. You're, you are so angry at God. It is lodged in your subconscious. That's why it's hard. It's, that's why you can worship so far, and you can't bust through a cap. You have a ceiling over your life because you are offensive. You are offended. You are angry. You are sad. You are bothered by God, and you won't admit it. Because you don't. If you, you want to say that scripture confidently, be okay with calamity. Be okay with calamity. Be okay with some things not making sense and you don't have the answer. Be okay with some turmoil hitting your life. Be okay with seven years of famine. Yeah. What you don't know is coming is seven years of plenty. Yeah. Promise is not pronounced until the correct time. Right. And if you don't take your time to realize it takes a process to gather yourself for the promise, you'll never live in the pronouncement from heaven. <laughs> this is some good wisdom. But here's the concern. We get mad at the process. We forfeit the promise. Because we don't like steps 1 through 17. Because we want step 20. How dare we look our noses up at the Lord and say, haven't you treated me bad enough? Mm. Haven't I gone through enough stuff already? Haven't I had to suffer enough? Why me? And who knows, the moment that you say that, you extend your journey. I'm reminded of the children of Israel. What could have been 11 days took them 40 years. Maybe your delay is your fault because you're deceived. Maybe your delay is your fault because you're living deceived. Maybe your delay is your fault because you don't like his deity, what he's doing in your life and how he's doing it. Because you want, you want to become God and you think you can do better. And let me tell you something. You control every living person in the world and you tell me that's an easy job for you to do. 
because you want your life to change in the way that you want it to be. You can't be God. And the fact that we try to be God is outrageous. It shows how lunatic some of us really are when we start to step in and become what God is. He's God. Shall we be reminded about who he is and how he is and what he is, where he is, all the things about him? He is God, Elohim, El Shaddai. He's everything that we need. And the moment we try to take on his persona to change our process, we submit to a life called hell. I'm not going to get done at all. So I will say this last thing, and uh, we'll have part two next week. Ready? There are always discoveries to be made with God. I mean, I'm super encouraged today. I mean, I'm extra encouraged. There's always discoveries with God. And if you always live in the reality that there, are, that, that, that there is something more to him, you'll never be content with where you are. Content people are nothing but people who only wanted a little bit in the first place. <laughs> it's like a good, being a gold digger. You just, you know what I'm saying, Forky? You know, you just, you know, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do what I got to do until I get it. Okay, I'm done. You ain't call me, you don't text me no more. You don't, you don't invite me up. You don't have no dinner for me. You ain't send me a little kissy face emoji in the morning. You're like, man, what the heck is going on? Why they treat me this way? You don't like to be used. You don't. Everybody in here, shake your head no, because you don't like to be used. All of y'all, I said, wake up. You don't like to be used. So why do we use God? I don't use him a prompt. I don't, I don't do that, Pastor. What, what, what are you praying real hard for right now until he answers? What prayers do you have reserved only because you feel like you need this real bad? And the moment that you get it, you're going to be done. So, yeah, yeah, you've been using God. So there are always discoveries, but discoveries, hear me closely. Discoveries are made in the valley. Discoveries are only made in the valley. Only. <laughs> but here's the thing. The greatest discovery you can discover in the valley is that he's with me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Amen. We become blind of him when we allow our valley to suggest a different viewpoint because you can feed your soul on whatever you want to but you have the opportunity to encounter God in a way that other people don't get to encounter when they live outside of the valley because valley discoveries are the best discoveries Valley discoveries are the best discoveries. How can I say that? And this is my one point I'll make that we can shout about and then we'll go home. Ready? Later on in Psalm 23, he says, Thou prepares the table before me. Pay attention, y'all. It's gonna, it's gonna, I'm going to throw up the podium in just a moment. Thou prepares the table before me in the presence of my what? Let's say this slowly. Thou preparest a table in the presence of my enemies. He hath prepared a table. Notice I only moved one time. He prepares a table. I didn't say in the presence. Because now I'm too close and I'm surrounded looking at the wrong thing. So I stop at table because the only point of that scripture was for, was for you to realize I'm at a table. 
We get so fixated, though, on the enemies that's at the table. Y'all don't want me to preach today. That's fine. Because if all you see is the enemies, you've missed the fact that he led you to this table. But we say, God, why am I surrounded by all these things that are going on? I mean, oh my gosh, I mean, how would I had enough? But did you forget that it's your table? Did you forget that he set you at your table and gave you an audience? Did you forget that he prepared this place just for you and you want to look at the wrong thing at your table? It's like you invited a whole bunch of strangers into your house and trying to figure out why they're there. It's your house. But God says, I prepared this table in the presence of, because we all have a lot of things going on. But the issue is we lose sight of the table, Miss Roz. And we look at only the enemies. You're upset because you can't find value in what's going on around you. But you fail to ask the one who placed you at this table. You pray things like, Lord, take me out. When you should be, Lord, help me to realize that this is my table. I don't have to get up. This is my table. I don't have to be moved. This is my table. And when you realize you are the owner of the table, you want to allow the audience to bother you. Yes, it's enemies, but at the table, they don't have access to you. Why? It's your table. Why do we live in defeat? Let me help you, and I'm done. The, the issue is, if you see a lot of your enemies, you are at the right place. She got it. If you just realize, wow, all the stuff is going on around me, oh, I must be at my table. <laughs> this, this. Two people, thank you all so much, two people, for getting this understanding today. I, I believe you're going to live in great victory this week. But for all the rest of them, let me re rewind and, and play it again for you. If, if this is your table and you're focused only on him, and if all these enemies are around you, I don't have to pray to get away. I have to pray to stay focused. Because the more that I'm focused, I'm not concerned about all the other things going on around me. Here is why, y'all. Because why would God sit me at my table for me to be devoured? Why would God sit me right here and allow me to be trashed and allow the lion to come in to eat me up and all these things? Why would he do that? So because he's not, sit down, book. The reason why he's not going to do that, you're in front of my camera, sit down. The reason why he's not going to do that, I was, they were like, Chris was like, <laughs> the camera. I'm glad you focused, man, woman of God. Here's the concern. If I look up, too much, I'm going to be defeated. But if I only look at the table, I'm always going to live in triumph. Sometimes your victory is compromised because of your neck and your placement of your head. I refuse to look, to stay here like, oh my gosh, look at all these beautiful things. Those AMSR videos with the little, you can hear the sound, they, they, their mouths are watering because they're only looking at all the food around them. Like, oh my gosh, I got this chicken breast over here, got this macaroni and cheese, I got this broccoli, I got all these little things. They had for, completely forgotten about the, um, the camera and anyway. all this thing, they're looking at all the food on the table. I watched one yesterday, I was like, Lord Jesus, she's just, it's a lot going on. But it was all the food at the table, she was so in just here. She didn't even look at the camera no more because she was focused on what's in front of her. My point is, and I'll stop here, learn how to fix your eyes on the table. If you learn how to do that, you won't be tormented at your table. Okay? Amen. 
part two next Sunday. Here's, the, here's, here's my prayer for us, though, because I still have, I have my time to get through. The, here's the concern for me. <clears throat> Sorry. The concern for me and the altar call is that we will become a people that is so focused that we don't have to compromise our weekend encounter to build you back up. How many miracles would we see every single Sunday if we didn't have to work to pull you out of the muck and the mire? Today was a push. We just had two good, two greats. We had a great breakthrough at river, the river, the stream service. Had a, you know, it was some good traction going on. But I'm telling you, the way you live your life will break a level in the spirit that will cause us all to fall because of your disobedience that week. So the moment that I give into my flesh, I give way and suggestion to the face of the enemy. I'm focused on the enemy. And that means that when I take this platform, when I come in here and sit in the seat, that everything can be compromised because I refuse to look away from my enemy. This is the place of the table. Rivers Church, this is the table. And we get to sit and feast. Because at the table is nourishment. Nourishment. Chris, every time it's time to eat, he's like, nourishment. He he just wants, he's like, nourishment. And the moment that we choose to say, you know what? This is my opportunity to have a community feast with believers. At Sunday at 3 o'clock, Thursday at 7 p.m., I get to sit amongst my community. And I may come, come in here with my head down a little bit, but when I get to the table, some, because my, my joy is contagious, the, the person sitting next to me, their joy jumps on me, and now we're both joyful. Because I don't, I don't stay away from the table when I, that I don't feel like it. I come to the table because I know there's something here for me that I've got to get. And I'm not leaving here until I get it. That's why Jacob held on as long as he did. Because he said, I know you have what I need. And I will not let go until you bless me. And I'm not going anywhere. And you may look like a fool, but I rather look like a fool. And my faith is increasing at the same time. Why? Because holding on to what people can't see doesn't make sense to them. But it sure should make sense to believers. I hold on. Hold on. And I'm not, and even when I feel like I'm losing grip, I still hold on. The strength of God comes into my arm and I can hold on a bit longer. And until I see a change, I'm not compromising my seat at the table. Because what happens when, when we go out to eat and it's taking too long? We'd be like, where's the waiter at? We've been here for all this time. Where are they at? I see over there. Hello? We ready. Banging on the table and stuff. Leave a, leave a one-star review. We do the same thing with God. Hello? You see, I've been, I've been waiting like, I'm hello. Then you get up and leave because there's been no service. And it's not that the fact that there's been no service. You don't like the last thing that he said. All right, I'll to call. Because y'all, y'all don't want to talk to me today. You can't treat God like he's your server. We're not going to be a people like that. Okay? Amen? Amen? No. We have the honor of serving him. Honor. So let's always treat it that way. Because the moment that we change seats is where the dishonor comes into play. Okay? Amen. Father, my prayer today is that that with part one of this message, you have caused a revival in our hope. You have ignited us 
And I just believe, Lord, by faith that we're not going to walk out of here feeling the same, going back to a same situation with the same emotional attachment to it. But help us to see something differently. And I bless you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank God for all that he has done. Amen.